Hello everyone, Evis T here, welcome back. Okay, we've concluded the basic tutorial for Crusader Kings 2. By now you should have a firm enough handle on how to actually play the game, so some of you might have tried uh, Conquering Ireland yourself, some of you may have started up games elsewhere. Um, there are a few things that I think we need to cover. One of them is playing in a more political environment, so for example playing, under a, playing as a vassal under a lord. But I think we might want to do something a little bit different. So what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the Republic DLC. So, first question is, how does one play as a Republic? Well, the answer to that is quite straightforward. All you need to do is select the Republics tab here in the Character Selections sheet, and you can pick the basic options here. Now, we're going to be playing as this guy here, Grand Mayor Bostain, Bostain? We'll get, it, get there eventually, of Gotland. Now, the reason that we're playing him is because his realm is here. It's uh, up here between uh, Sweden and uh, what will eventually be Finland. And uh, over here through Denmark. And you can expand down the coast of uh, you know, northern France and uh, northern Germany here. And uh, also across the east coast of England and further, depending on how you play the game. All the others are located here in the Mediterranean. Now, when you're near another... Republic, you have to deal with embargo wars, and we'll cover those in detail later. But for now, all you need to know is they are a pain in the ass, and they make it quite difficult to learn the basics of the game because you're already having to learn how to deal with these goddamn embargo wars. So, we will select Mayor here, Grand Mayor. Yes, it is. There's a TST, isn't it? Botstein or Botstein? I'm not sure. I'm sure I'll be corrected by someone. And um, you see we have our vassals here, so let's choose a start date, we'll choose Stamford Bridge, because why the hell not? And uh, where are we? Yeah, there we go. And let's play. Okay, for those of you who've come straight into this, i.e. those of you who already know, who already know how to play the game and may not have seen my original tutorial series, here's how I approach these tutorials. I will begin by going over the UI and all the basic concepts. I will then play through the game for a few hours to show you how those basic concepts are used and expand on some of the more intricate concepts as time goes by. So now you know how I'm approaching this, hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit more out of this. So if you're already familiar with the basic interface and concepts, you might want to skip straight to the, shall we say, Let's Play Stroke Tutorial part, which uh, will be up in due course. Okay. So first of all, you'll notice that the UI has a nice little uh, reskin. However, everything else remains the same. Click your character portrait to bring up your character sheet and check your stats. You can click the shield here to check your uh, domain. You'll use this screen quite a lot, in fact. So you click your own shield there in the character portrait because it allows you to check your income and your expenses. And that brings us to our first core concept. The Republic is about money. It is about getting as much money coming in as you possibly can and minimizing the money that you need to spend going out. It's not so much about territory. Territory is more a means to an end, and that end is money. So, whilst you can, in theory, go off and conquer huge swathes of land, and you know, you, you do get benefits for doing so, what you should really be focusing on is maximizing your income. So, again, just to reiterate, important screen is here, click the shield on your character portraits, check your income and expenses. I believe there's also this little screen here which can be quite useful to give you a breakdown of where you're getting money from as well. So you can lock and unlock that one if you like, or leave it unlocked and just hover over it when you want to use it. I'm going to lock it because it's quite useful with the Republic DLC. We need to set our ambitions but we're not going to do that just yet. Once some, some of the more observant amongst you may have noticed the Republic button here. This is new. This doesn't appear in the vanilla game. So clicking this tells you the Republic you're in charge of, which is the Republic of Gotland. It also shows the current ruler here, which is me, or possibly even you. Over here is your expected successor. Now, how does the, um, shall we say, inheritance laws work in the Republic? Well, the new patricians, or the new grand mayors, or the new serene doge, whatever the title is, the new liege lord, shall we say, 
is elected. But this is something a bit more akin to a modern election, in that the most important things are your prestige, the respect, and the amount of money that you spend. So if you hover over the respect score here, you'll see a breakdown of it. You have an age factor and a prestige factor for everyone involved. You can see here the respect and prestige of this character is currently at zero because this character is only 14. Goldsmeld here has the age factor 1681 and prestige 20. So the electorate favour older characters. So older characters will get um, that age factor working for them. <coughs> beg your pardon, and prestigious characters will also get bonus working for them. So it is always a good idea to make sure that your preferred heir has a title, preferably a landed title, but you can also give them uh, honorary titles because some of those will give them uh, prestige over time. This one doesn't unfortunately. If you hover over it, you can see that it will give them a plus 50 opinion. I have to pay them a small wage, but they don't get any prestige for it. Some titles, like I say, do give you prestige. So you want to make sure you give those to those characters because they can start building that prestige score and that will make it easier for them to get elected. Now this is assuming that you want to stay in charge of your Republic because there are benefits to um, allowing someone else to take the reins for a while, but we'll get onto that in a while. So you can choose to set your campaign fund here. You can add money to your campaign fund and you can take money out of your campaign fund. The only time your campaign fund is used up is when your character dies and the election takes place. So bear that in mind. You can put as much money in here as you want and you can take it back out again. No problem. No questions asked. It's a savings account, if you will, but it's drained completely on the death of your current character. So, you know, if you're really hurting for money, take some money out of the campaign fund. If you've got some spare, stick it in the campaign fund because you can take it out again afterwards and it will probably do some good while it's there. Beneath here you will see the major families associated with your republic. So Af Stenkiraka, Stenkiraka, whatever, is here. Guldsmed is here. Henjun, Gildehusen, Gildehusen. Oh, um, I should probably give a uh, small shout out to Ray Harryhausen, who unfortunately passed away recently. Great filmmaker, great special effects artist, true pioneer. Love the guy to bits, love his work, even if I do find stop animation a bit creepy. But he's the reason why. So, anyway, with that little um, nod to a, a legend out of the way, there's also... How do you pronounce that A thing? Is it Straben? I don't know, I'm, I'm sure I've got some Scandinavian subscriber somewhere who can correct my horrific pronunciation. Incidentally, if you do know the correct, correct pronunciation, feel free to send a comment and I will use it, because it's the only way I'll learn. Each of them have their respect scores. As we've been over, respect is a combination of your campaign funds, your prestige, and your age. Now, the person with the highest respect does not necessarily win, but if they have a lead of about three or four hundred, it's very likely that they will. So bear that in mind. Now, what's up next? Well, you have the houses, the great houses belonging to each of these families. Yours is the one in green. You can click it, and it's just like any other holding. You can never lose this holding. It can't be conquered, it can't be taken from you. That means the upgrades that you purchase for it are safe. Unfortunately, they cost a lot of money compared to the benefit that you get from them. You can get those same benefits by spending that money more cheaply elsewhere. So again, if you have spare money, it's quite wise to invest it in your mansion, your home, your palace, whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, but, at the same time, that money could be better spent elsewhere. So, divide your investments between the safety of your family palace and the more risky but lucrative options of expanding further overseas. Beneath here you will see the trade post limit. You always have a minimum limit of four. Your, your limit will never go beneath that. But the base is one. It can be enhanced by constructing mansion upgrades. So you see here, uh, not the mansion upgrades, where is it? Map room. There's some upgrade here that will allow you to, I'm sure it was mansion, maybe I need to let the game run for a minute, but either way, some of these upgrades will allow you to uh, house more trade posts. You also can get more trade posts from having adult male family members in your court. Now, that's a double-edged sword. 
They may increase the size that you can have, but unfortunately they also demand income. So if you check here, you'll see family dues. That's a measure of the wages that you're needing to pay to your family. So ideally, you always want to be at your trade post limit because that means that you're not wasting any money paying out salary to family members just so they can hang around and try and pick up girls. Okay, finally beneath each of these uh, trade post limits you will see the trade posts that you currently have. So if I click on this one you will see I have Gotland. If you move away and click it will center on that trade post. So that's my trade post there, that's the territory that it's in. Each territory can house one trade post and one trade post alone. So immediately you will see that uh, there's going to be some conflict there because believe me you want more trade posts. Okay so we've covered this section here the Republic tab, we've covered clicking on the shield to check your income and your expenses and we've briefly touched on how to get more trade posts and why you should invest some money in your palace but not too much. So great, we've already got a pretty damn good start for the game here. But there's more we need to discuss. So grab a drink, pause the video if you need a minute to take stock of everything and we're going to talk about trade posts, how they work and why they're important. So. Do what you need to do, and let's get started on the next one. Okay, trade posts. You can construct a trade post in any territory that has a ocean adjacent to it. Ocean, sea, large body of water, you, you know, whatever. Okay, I'm not going to be aiming for correct oceanographic terms here, or even correct terms or pronunciation at all. But let's take uh, Smiland here. Smiland. I don't know. I need to learn how to pronounce that. If you click on it, you will see that you have two tabs here next to the holdings. Trade and holdings. Trade, holdings. Holdings you should be familiar with by now. If you're not, then go back and read the basic 101, well, watch the basic 101 tutorials I've done. The trade tab shows whether or not there is a trade post in the area and what you need for there to be a trade post in the area. So here we have no trade post. Hover over the empty holding icon and it will tell you the conditions for actually having that post. So you see, is Merchant Republic, you can't build trade posts if you're not playing as a Republic. You can't be embargoed by the ruler who owns that uh, particular stretch. That is the highest level ruler, by the way. So for example, uh, you see in Ostergod land, it is the, still the, um, my re it's still my relationship with the king, not his vassal, that makes that choice. So if you're trying to bribe people, don't bribe the guy who owns the territory, bribe his liege. And if his liege has a liege, bribe that liege's liege. Go straight to the top of the chain. And so you can see here, the only thing that I've not got is enough. I don't have enough money. That's basically it. The opinion and distance are the main factors in how much money it costs you. The greater the opinion of the individual who you need that opinion with, in this case, whoever is the king of Sweden, and the closer it is to, I believe it's your capital, not your nearest trade post, but I might be wrong, I might have to double check that, um, the lower the cost. On the other hand, the greater the distance and the lower the opinion, the higher the cost. So you see here the base cost is 150, I only need to pay 187, so getting something in Smarland might be wise. Or is it? We'll get onto that in a moment. Trade posts provide you with two primary benefits. First, their existence gives you income. So if we check the trade post here in Gotland, you can hover over it here and it will show you the income from that trade post. So base income is 6, uh, get plus 15.1% bonus for its trade zone, we'll cover that in a moment. It's connected to the capital which gives me a plus 40% bonus, and trade practices is a certain technology that I believe you can research, that gives you an extra 10% as well. So that's making me 9.9 .9 gold a year I believe. Yep. You see here, ta trade income, 9.9. 9.91 if you want to be precise, but uh, you know, the decimal point is an inconvenience. Hang on a minute, I've got to take my dried frog pills. Hang on. <sighs> Much better, thank you. Okay, um, where were we? Dried frog pills? No. Trade posts, of course, trade posts. Trade posts also are useful because they give you Carsus Belly. 
Uh, those of you who have played the base game will be aware of the immense frustration of wanting to wage war and conquer a place, but not finding a valid excuse to do so. Any territory in which you have a Casus Bell in which ca sorry, any territory that contains a city and a trade post that you own, so you need to own the trade post, but not necessarily the city, you have a Casus Belli to claim that city. Yes, that's right. Merely by paying, in this case, 226 gold, I would have a Casus Belli to claim that city. Well, you know, that's nice, you know, that's not much, but, you know, you know what, is there anything more we can do with that? Yes, there is. If you own both the city and the trade post, you have a Casus Belli on the entire county. Yes, that's right. By building a trade post in Suomi here, and then pressing a claim and seizing the city of Turku, I could then press a Casus Belli on the entire of Suomi and add it to my own realm. This is why no one really likes playing next door to republics, because they tend to poach coastal territories with annoying regularity, because you can't stop them building the bloody trading posts unless you embargo them. And in order to embargo them, you need another um, you need another republic to enter the war with. We'll cover embargo wars in a moment. But those are unique Casus Belli available only to the Republic. So remember, when you're positioning your trade posts, their positioning, if they're connected to your capital or not, will affect their income. Their position affect their position relative to trade zones will affect their income. And you also need to consider whether or not you might want to use them to press a claim you on um, cities in that territory as well and possibly ultimately the territory itself as a whole so trade zones let's cover trade zones over here in the map overlays you will see that there are republic trade zones so in this case you'll see all this belongs to Gotland and then there are family trade zones so in order to see the family ones you first need to click a territory held by that relevant republic so you can see here that these specific areas are trade zones held by those different families. You should recognize the names. Um, Gildenhus here, um, Guildsmed there, Hengenum there, Hednum. Is that a silent J or does it soften the N? Or, and Straben. Straben. I don't know if that's correct pronunciation or not, but I like saying it. And then there's mine there, the completely unpronounceable one, which you can see has the glowing blue outline. So, a trade zone is a block of trading, shall we say, resources which are all linked. So in this case, this C acts for me as a linking element, this C acts as a linking element for Hejnum. Now, in order for you to have control of a C, you need to have more trade posts bordering it than anyone else. So if no one else has a trade post, this one lonely little trade post here gives me control of the C of Ireland. And um, if I were to build a second one, I would still have control over it. If someone built one here and I didn't build a second post, it would be contested and it would belong to no one. So that's pretty straightforward. Whoever has the most trade posts has control of that C. If more than one person has an equal number of trade posts, and that trade post is the greatest number in the area, so for example, one family has one trade post, two families have two trade posts, no one owns it. It's got to be one clear winner. Now, what this means is that if I build a trade posts in, say, Upland here, it will be connected to my capital because I own this trading block here. It will also form a part of one trading zone. So if you see here, the trade zone has a size associated with it. And if you hover over it, it tells you the number of trade posts in this trade zone, that this, the number of trade posts in this trade um, zone that this is part of. You also have trade zone value. That improves with trade posts and cities. So let's say, for example, going back to Suomi here, I build a trade post there. That's brilliant. It's connected to the capital because it has an overseas route all the way back to the capital. Um, if I then claim the city, I also get the city added to the value of that trade zone as well. So this trade post here in Gotland that actually gets a bonus to its value because the trade zone it's a part of increases in value because that trade zone now contains a city. So, bottom line, you, you in, a, in a perfect world, 
all of your trade zones are just one big trade zone. You control all the seas along all the coastal areas with all the trading ports that you have. But you only get this bonus if it's your family. Owning the Republic does not give you a trade zone wherever the Republic is. It is only for those families. So you need to make the choice. Do you compete with other families for control of these zones? Or do you try to expand further where there aren't any currently existing families? And we'll get into that when we start playing the game because both ideas have their relative merits. So, trade posts. The bottom line with trade posts, you build them. Um, the, depending on the number of trading resources within their trade zones, so trade posts and cities, they give you some income. If they're connected to the capital, they give you some income. And they are connected to trade zones. Trade zones, ideally, you want them to be as large as possible, encompassing as many adjacent seas and con containing as many cities and um, trade posts as you can. And if you do that, your trade posts will be at their maximum effectiveness. As with any holding, you can also build improvements on these trade posts as well. And these will allow you to increase the value of the trade they represent, get some taxation from them, or you know add a little bit of defence, because these holdings, unlike your palace, can be taken during war. The good news is that the occupation of them has virtually no effect on your war score whatsoever, but the levies that you can get from them are useful. That said, most of the wars you'll be fighting with mercenaries. And this is again coming back to the original idea, the key element in this game is the money. So, we're going to call this first episode of this tutorial to a close there. Just to recap what we've learned in a very quick summary, this is the Republic button. It shows the current ruler, shows the expected successor. The successor is elected based on their respect score. Unless you have about three or four hundred points lead on the nearest competitor, odds are that you're not going to get elected. You can improve that with your campaign fund, to which you can add and remove funds at any time, and it is only used up on the death of your current character. This is a list of the families, and it shows the head of each family. This uh, shows the family's current homes, if you will. By clicking on it, you can build improvements for it. Build improvements for it, it's safe, but you don't get quite as good a return as you would invest in that money elsewhere. Beneath that is your trade post limit. We've discussed how the trade post limit is calculated and the fact that it can never be lower than four. And then finally below that is a list of all the trade posts you currently own. Trade posts can be constructed in any coastal territory. You simply click the territory, go to the trade tab, and you can then build a trade post assuming you satisfy all the criteria. And the key one with that is usually money. Again, focus on making money. The existence of a trade post gives you a casus belly to claim any city that exists in the same territory as that post. Bear in mind, however, that if you're fighting that casus belly, it will be against the liege lord of that entire realm. So, for example, in this case, if I press to claim here in um, here in Upland, <laughs> because it's easier to pronounce, I'd have to fight the entirety of Sweden. And in fact, I don't think I'd be able to do that because the um, King of Sweden is my liege. So, Casus Belli, then also if you have the city and the trade post, you have Casus Belli on the entire county, and you can seize the entire county. Trade posts are far more effective when connected to trade zones. To form a trade zone, you need control of the sea. In order to have control of the sea, you just need to have more trade posts bordering it than anyone else. Do so and you can see your family's name over it in the Family Trade Zones view. So for example, if I build a trade post here in Metalpad, I'll gain control of the Sea of Bothnia. The Sea of Bothnia is connected to the Sea of Aland, or Aland, however it's pronounced, and therefore this trade post would form, this trade post and this sea would form a another trade zone linked to this trade zone, thus creating one giant trade zone and making all the trade posts within it more effective. So building a trade post here would not only get me money from that trade post, but it would also make this trade post down here more effective. And that's the basics. So it takes a little bit of time to get your head around, and often it's best played with an example. So join me next week. What we'll do is we'll actually start playing through this save, and um, I will demonstrate these concepts through example. But for now, 
I'm Evie Stay, signing off.